this accountable uh, uh, care panel is uh, focused on the role of ACOs and ACO-like organizations and how they can integrate care to improve quality, cost, and outcomes uh, for conditions, after heart conditions such as CIP. What's to start that? Sure, I can start. Um, so, first of all, I'm going to so we have, we offer disease management programs to all of our senior population. Monarch Healthcare has 42,000 uh, Medicare Advantage uh, patients and that we care for. And then in addition to that, in our pioneer organization, the ACO, we have another 23,000 in the Monarch organization. I'm also responsible for the MSSP uh, uh, ACOs at Prime Care and at Apple Care, where we have an, an, an additional 22,000 seats. Um, my comments today will focus on the Monarch organization. Um, what we do is, is offer a, a, a sort of a three-part program in our disease management, case management approach. Um, we, the first part is physician engagement, engaging physicians in, in the process of you know, CFP more closely um, and providing an incentives to do so. Um, patient engagement, a critical part, a very challenging part in the people service world. And finally, sort of more interventional complex care management um, that looks a lot like maybe what Care More does. Um, And so with physicians, we're focused on, on um, the gold guidelines, you know, training them to, to uh, treat and, um, and provide medication therapy per those guidelines. Um, so there's an emphasis on early diagnosis and accurate diagnosis. Um, and then uh, looking for barriers to adherence. Um, we can get into more of that later. In terms of patient engagement, um, we offer supportive services. Patients don't recognize care coordination and case management as a, as a value, valuable service to them. That doesn't make sense to them. So we've had to package it differently and, and offer them services that they do value, like transportation, uh, uh, assistance with picking up their prescriptions, assistance in rolling into SPAP programs, things of that nature. Um, and then finally, we have a, an inter interdisciplinary team that manages our, 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 our complex care management program. And, um, and we can get into more about that. Yes. Well, uh, I guess my response in, in part is, is the uh, specific challenges that we're going to see, we are seeing, with certain providers that may or may not be part of ACOs as they evolve here, in particularly in California, particularly community health centers, uh, other safety net providers in the county, um, and practices that have traditionally seen large numbers of Medi-Cal patients that will increasingly become part of these uh, ACO or ACO-like organizations. Most of, the, most of the research that we've seen with ACOs have come primarily from the Medicare population, not as many with Medicaid. Some recent data has come out that um, haven't shown a lot of potential benefits, certainly a lot of challenges in, um, in adopting some of these new delivery models that we think will be important for the success of these ACOs. So I think dealing with uh, patients uh, and populations that are uh, more multicultural, um, have uh, tremendous challenges based on the, on the social conditions in which people bring uh, to, their, to the care that they're trying to get from their, from their physicians and their clinics will be much more challenging, I think, uh, if, as we involve uh, the safety net in the ACOs. So I think we need to, uh, we need to look at more innovation, uh, more ideas for uh, uh, how we design these ACOs as we involve community health centers, county health care systems, uh, uh, disproportionate share of private hospitals as, as they evolve and as they particularly take, uh, take care of the older uh, patients um, where you see the prevalence of COPD increase, that'll be a, a big challenge. Um, also, as, as uh, Dr. Bowman mentioned, we're really talking here about changing the way we pay for medical care. You know, we need to you know, pay physicians in hospitals based on how many people walk through the door. And, moving away to more to, to, to paying for based on value and quality. Uh, this will be also very difficult and challenging for, uh, for the safety net. Uh, not that they're not up for the challenge. There certainly are. Many of them are, are thinking about it. They're, they're trying to be very innovative and forward thinking about how to do it. But I think it will require a lot more um, patience, uh, innovation, uh, thinking, uh, thinking out of the box working with patients that have not been used to uh, working, uh, not used to a, a private sector patient population. So I think we're going to have to be very challenged uh, as we involve the safety net in uh, ACOs in the future, particularly for the management of chronic diseases. We focus our initiatives and our efforts on providing patient services, patient education, and delivery of care. 
the idea of taking the medical home and transforming that into what we call our primary care innovation model, where we take the fundamental design of the actual primary care functionality, the structure, the support staff, the front and back desk staff, and we've added components into that in the ACO structure so that in our primary care practices, we utilize that leverage of putting in bed case managers, social workers to engage for um, our at risk and high population, high risk populations, excuse me. But also, but being innovative and, and utilizing pharmacists that sit and do med reconciliation with patients. We've developed programs that have focused on encouraging physical activity, occupational life therapy for some of our patients in these disease specific programs, um, and then outreach to the populations who are less likely to actually participate in those. So we've outreached to thousands by doing both uh, match, uh, match mailing to thousands of our Medicare beneficiaries to encourage them to join our new fitness program, is where we host. Um, a, several one-day seminars on activity. Um, we allow them to consult with the physical therapist and some other um, activity therapy programs so that they can get a feel for these programs. Uh, and in addition to that, we also are working on increasing our, our strong research, research capabilities at UCLA. Um, I think specifically also focusing on encouraging the activity and direction where patients go within an accountable care organization encouraging appropriate facility usage. So when we're talking about readmissions, as to diverting patients to appropriate urgent care facilities. We also have developed an evaluation and treatment uh, center, which is like an extensive model clinic where patients are able to get same-day access if they can't get that access in the primary care office, where they'll have access to the specialists at the hospitals that they need. Um, and really developing an accountable care structure delivery and method of providing these services in our ACO um, so that instead of leveraging activity, individual contracts, whether that be with a commercial care or with, MS, with uh, Medicare, we're focusing on being able to, to tackle our population in the new world. Yeah, I think that much of our model of care is uh, focused on patient-seeking provider, and I'm, I'm not sure if there's any consideration in how providers can search out patients to uh, be more proactive in their management. Is there any? Uh, yeah, and I think not just patients with COPD in this case, but also patients at risk. I mean, yesterday we had a discussion about diabetes and trying to focus just not on people with A1Cs of seven or more, but maybe with people with four or fives to try to prevent them from progressing to diabetes later on. I think the equivalent model could be thought of. I think the ACO model so far has not been most successful in doing that, at least the data that I've seen. Um, and I think there's an often a lot of opportunities, I think, uh, through these experimental, these innovative models. And that was maybe to be a place for to do that monitor, but you know, try to identify these patients, try to interrupt the health of the course of the disease to prevent people from getting COPD in the first place. We leverage you developing some very rich and robust registries for our practices and utilizing some predictive modeling software as well as uh, our decision support teams. We've actually tried to do that exactly that. Reach out to patients before they reach out to us. Because usually when they reach out to us, uh, it's through the front doors of the ER. And that's not where we want to engage the patients. Uh, we want to engage these patients early on. We want to encourage their usage of their primary care doctor. And I think in my sense of disease management, we still want the driver of that patient's continuum of care to be their primary care doctor. And encouraging those types of relationships. And so question, uh, this question addresses uh, how these new innovations such as electronic medical records, patient self-management, telemedicine, are factored into the healthcare models in treating these chronic diseases. One of the things that we found when we entered the Pioneer ACO program was, was the amount of, the staggering amount of leakage um, that's present. So on average, our ACO patients see 22 unique clinicians per year. So that's just baffling. When on the, on the flip side, our HMO, Medicare Advantage patients, see on average four uh, clinicians per year. Um, so a huge amount of fragmentation. And what you find, of course, is that we only have a relationship with a small fraction of all of those physicians that they're seeing. And, and so there, there, there's not an EMR system that covers all of them and connects all of them. So um, we had developed a practice, practice a, a solution called Practice Connect, which is sort of really a practice management tool for authorization and referrals on the managed care side of the business. But it present, provided us with a web-based interface that physicians can use to log in to check patient, uh, you know, med recent medical history and, and care gaps in care and so forth. Um, it was really designed to promote, um, secondarily after, after referrals and authorizations, to promote uh, star quality measure completion and, and HCC score um, uh, suspect codes and so forth. 
So what we were able to do for DSU is repurpose that same tool, which is web-based and all, all requires a login, to show our fee-for-service physicians a longitudinal view of the patient's care over the last 12 months. So for the first time, this fee-for-service physician, which only accounts for 3.8% of total medical costs in, in, on average for these patients, can now see the entire spectrum of care, all their recent hospitalizations, if they've had a pneumovax and flu vaccine, um, if they've, uh, how many times they've been admitted, which cardiologists are they seeing, how many cardiologists are they seeing. They have access to all of that data at the point of care now. Um, and so that was one way where we were able to circumvent the, 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 uh, the challenge where not every doc is on the same EMR or even has an EMR. This sort of uh, allowed us to create that more cohesive communication. I think the other, in terms of technology, is where you're going at, right? I think is the, is the interaction between the clinician and the patient and how we can exploit uh, using um, telemedicine, cell phones, even landline phones to better communicate with patients. I saw a presentation yesterday and early uh, the development of a, of a trial uh, in healthcare partners where they're actually trying to communicate with COB, COB, T, B, COPD patients on the telephone and uh, asking some simple questions, and the patients basically push one, two, or three, depending on the, on, on the question they ask, and then the answer to that potentially could trigger an intervention, either another call uh, by a nurse or a home visit that could potentially um, interrupt a potential readmission of a hospital or an admission. Uh, so I think, you know, there's really, I don't have much in the day, we don't know whether or not this technology is better than you know, the traditional standard methods, but I think we need to study it. We need to you know, employ um, some new ideas for using uh, uh, telemedicine and technology for interacting with our patients. Um, I'm quite a surprise how many um, elders actually have cell phones and have smartphones, and iPads and things. So I think we need to look through how to take advantage of that um, as we develop these innovations uh, in, our, in the way we interact with uh, patients. I, coming from a, a previous background in, in the service where we've been on an EMR for years, when I entered UCLA a couple of years ago, I was astonished. I just couldn't believe we weren't on one electronic medical record. Um, and we're still looking at our wounds. We just implemented earlier this year, and uh, I think it was a challenge. Um, and I think it continues to be a challenge, but we're quickly seeing the benefits of being able to leverage that electronic medical record. Uh, but I think a big component of our success as a group, and I think as medical groups across the state in California, uh, we can leverage programs like the program we are in, and I think Dr. Feldman spoke to this earlier, but we're working with our health plans to share information on member activity. Uh, we know where our patients' uh, activities lies when they are within our walls and when they visit our facilities, but outside of the 180 some on offices that we have in our major practices or one of our flagship hospitals, we don't know exactly where they're going. But we're working with our health plans to share that information on these, these specific patients. Um, and then it's taken that concept of focusing on uh, else, but those one percenters, those five percenters, and then the two thirds is really where that engagement needs to be with those uh, patients and those relationships and leveraging things like using the electronic medical record to message patients, um, our after visit summaries to include patient education for some of these disease specific patients. Specifically, those patients who we identify have these disease specific conditions, but not leveraging some of the um, specialists or some of the care that they should seek out um, to avoid some of the readmissions or some of the um, cost pending. Um, metrics that we're looking to engage. The VA has its own electronic health care record, but it's only obviously confined to the VA, but the VA has reached out and is able to share information through another portal with uh, several other health plans, one of them being Kaiser uh, in Southern California, and it's expanding. And I think other uh, innovations that have come out through the VA are secured text messaging, uh, a web portal for patients, uh, uh, patient self-management. So, uh, and, and the, the VA has embarked on this uh, a mobile tablet for, for a select group of veterans to allow them to engage in all aspects of their care, including the ability to look into their medical record and every, every note in their electronic health record. And so these are things, are things that will obviously improve the communication and case management we've all sort of talked about. Um, let me just move on. I'd like yes. to comment on that real quick. But that within the Epic solution that we're using next month, we're also looking to leverage a very similar system with other Epic clients, and there are other um, software companies that are also utilizing it. But it's a concept they call it. I think within Epic, it's called Care Everywhere. It's those.
those participating organizations. And you know, we we are very encouraged and, and looking forward to those type of relationships. And I think that is a huge um, step in the right direction as the VA and other organizations join these HIE examples of being able to improve quality. Um, I think we'll also see that help with the customer. Okay. I, I would only add that um, you know, quality in this dimension in, in the last panel, quality is the new currency, right? So. Uh, the EMR and our managed care line of business cut about 85% of our participating physicians. We learned the hard way how much harder it is to survive in a quality-based and performance environment when you don't have the EMR that connects all those other physicians. Um, they're providing high-quality care, we're sure of that, um, because when we do a subjective review with those physicians, we're, we're seeing the outcome, the admission rates are low, the readmission rates are low, but we can't collect the data because we don't have that, connect, that same connectivity. Um, and so it's no longer sort of a, you know, something that, that physicians, independent physicians need to, to start investing in. It's, 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 it's to survive and have to have an agreement for Maybe I can uh, segue to the next question. And it sort of uh, uh, covers the same elements as to how the organizations are working to improve patient self-management and adherence to prescribed treatment uh, regimens, which we all hope will translate into better outcomes. We developed a, or launched a program about 16 months ago called MONDES, and it is taking ambulatory trained um, and residency practice based pharmacists and embedding them in our primary care offices, um, which I will tell you was a challenge in the beginning because you have to get providers to also refer those patients, um, or some clinicians refer those patients to pharmacists. So uh, early on we had patients say, well, why do I need to see a pharmacist if my provider is prescribing this medication? Um, and the takeaway that we've gotten in the increased and uh, improved quality metrics that we have on a number of patients, specifically in this population also, um, is that by allowing patients and leveraging and utilizing the pharmacist and the practices to do med reconciliation, not only as a preventative measure when they come into the ambulatory practice, but also as an effort to treat their episodic care. So a patient goes to the emergency room and is also prescribed yet another medication or visits the specialist who's prescribed yet another medication. We're utilizing our pharmacists to be able to do med reconciliation where they're connecting the dots and also connecting the providers, communicating and utilizing our electronic medical record to communicate with the specialists, to communicate with the, the hospital space groups where these patients are seeking care. Because oftentimes with this population, it's not in your medical home. It's not always in the place that we want them to be. It's um, within the ER. So we, we've leveraged this program to be able to uh, do real-time med reconciliation for a number of patients utilizing registries to also identify those patients from these programs. I could just take this question just in a slightly different direction. My, I guess what I would contribute to this is, you know, the concern that I have right now um, with the growing shortage of primary care clinicians, and not necessarily primary care physicians only, um, but the pretense, perhaps the success of this more ca uh, ambulatory care patient management is tied to our ability to move the needle with respect to training more people to go into primary care. Um, coming from a medical school, I can tell you we have moved the needle in spite of our efforts tremendously to try to persuade our students to go into primary care. They're just not doing it. Um, and so I think we need to, I think the success of this at a population basis a level will require a partnership, I think, between the health plans, uh, uh, between the medical groups and the medical schools and the nursing schools and the pharmacy schools and the OT schools to develop new ways of training our clinicians, our medical students, and our other, all the health professional students to take on some of these new, new approaches and these innovations and the way we manage our patients. I think this is going to be just crit critically important um, in the future because, you know, we just have this, this shortage of primary care clinicians and it's very difficult to find, uh, particularly the safety net uh, clinicians in primary care to really manage some of these patients. Uh, and as the yeah, population gets older, I think it's going to be a challenge. Uh, so so to, to affect the same sort of outcomes in the pioneer organization that we've experienced in the Medicare Advantage side, we tra transfer over a lot of the same processes. So training to the gold guidelines, as I mentioned before, identifying barriers to adherence, so there's patients coming up on the donut hole or um, they don't have the access to support that they require. They have arthritis, so they can't use the, the um, distance inhaler looking for those types of uh, identifiers. And those all work pretty well um, in the Pioneer uh, model. We're training the same physicians to do the same thing for the senior population. Um, 
But what we found that was different was patient engagement was very different with the deep service population than the managed care line of business. Managed care patients choose to be in a managed care program. Deep service patients have, have self-selected out of any managed care. And so, um, and I, I alluded to this earlier, but we, we have to develop ways to, to, to lure them in and show them value that was tangible and was meaningful to them um, to get them to engage. And so, uh, you know, in spite of all these high-tech um, solutions that we've developed and implemented, and, and following evidence-based guidelines, at the end of the day, the things that actually made a difference for our patients and got them engaged in our programs were things like care navigators. People who were sort of social worker backgrounds who could speak to the patient at the bedside or at home and help them navigate their benefits. Here's how you get access to this. Here's why you were the, this prescription was, was denied. Here's why it's so expensive. Here's an alternative. And help them figure out how they can afford their meds, how they can access different types of, of uh, care providers. And, and that has engendered trust, and it's built um, a much higher stickiness rate for those patients who really need to be in our case management programs, but otherwise we wouldn't be if we didn't demonstrate that sort of tangible value to them. Great, thank you.